Ready? All right, everybody, I think we're going to get going. Um, thank you so much for coming to Tweets and Votes. I think, that's our, I think that's our title. I'm Katie Culver. I teach in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and um, help the able Stephen Ward in the um, Center for Journalism Ethics. So we're going to talk, um, the, the goal of these afternoon sessions, based on some feedback we got uh, last year and in preceding conferences, was to give people more sort of hands-on takeaway messages, things you can put into action in reporting. Um, in the election season. So we're going to start out with just a few remarks from our very lovely and talented um, panelists, but then open it up to questions and, and feel free to ask any question. <laughs> there's, there's nothing too novice and nothing too sophisticated. Uh, we would really like to, to get at everything that everybody has to say. So I'm going to start out and, and just briefly introduce the panelists, but you have full bios um, in your packet. So Mark Smith, furthest over to my right, um, and, I, and I mean that geographically, not politically. <laughs> Mark heads up uh, Connected Action Consulting. He is a sociologist specializing in um, social, or social organization of online communities. I hope nothing broke over there. Um, and he's going to show some really interesting graphics. I, um, I followed Mark because of um, some software that he helped create, created on your own or helped work together. I think. Uh, not the coder. Yeah, yeah I, not, I, he's the, not a coder. Um, but some, um, some ways to create some really interesting visualizations of social networks. And then next up is Ryan Galantine from Obama for America, who holds a special place in my heart as a former student. Um, so Ryan is Midwest Digital Director based out of Chicago. He's overseeing outreach, um, which is trying to take online activities and, and engage people um, offline as well. And so have, um, trying to make the campaign merge these voices. And then finally, Thomas Keeley, based in Milwaukee, who wasn't in my class, but that's okay, we'll forgive you. He's a graduate of um, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, he has been advising businesses and nonprofits and political campaigns um, on the power of really well executed um, social media strategies um, since what well, I think you told me since Facebook was a year old 2005 Facebook yeah 2005 that's when Ryan was in my class so yeah we've all been at this for a while he's the founder of Keeley company which has um, had uh, we're, we're not gonna talk about current clients but in the past um, clients including Mark Newman um, and Ron Johnson both from Wisconsin so we're going to start out with Mark and take the floor. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, all. Uh, I'm Mark, uh, Mark Smith. I'm a sociologist. Uh, I'm also representing an organization, a not-for-profit, called the Social Media Research Foundation. I hope that's still on. Uh, we make software and we give it away. And so we uh, <laughs> believe that we are in the business of converting money into software. And what software we give away is something we call Node XL, and that's the network overview, discovery, and exploration add-in for Excel. Uh, the short description is if you can make a pie chart, you can now make a network diagram. And so our goal, and I'll be quick, is just to note that there is a little bit of social media, and that for the most part, civil society moved there and that most of the public discussion about who we are and where we're going is happening there. Um, now, things like Twitter may be a small part, but I think it punches above its weight. It really seems to seed new concepts, uh, but also places like Flickr and Facebook and YouTube, all very important. When you do these things, you're forming connections with one another, and those connections leave traces. Uh, we are interested in the collection analysis and visualization of collections of connections, of the ways that people link to one another in social media. And there are many ways in which people link to one another. I like to call these things the internet verbs, the uh, like, link, reply, rate, review, favorite, friend, follow, forward, edit, tag, comment, check in. Uh, these are all the ways that you actually form an association with another person. And so my punchline for you today is think link think about the ways that entities are connected to each other. And the challenge with ThinkLink has been that the tools are just not there. The tools require that you be a programmer. Uh, I am not a programmer. I'm simply a guy with a question I want answered. And so I will note that when you go to Twitter, Flickr, YouTube, all of these things, while they're different from one another, have one thing in common. And that is they all have networks in them. So networks are the data structure for the 21st century. If time series was the defining data structure of the 20th century, we are the, the data structure. Networks are the data structure of the 21st century, I should say. This is what a network looked like in 1934, a hand-drawn pencil and paper. And this was a map of who liked and disliked who on a football team. 
Uh, this is what networks are starting to look like now. This is people who tweeted the word GOP and how they clustered together. And one of the stories we're hearing all day today is polarization is an issue. Boy, is it. And it's measurable. It's a real issue. Uh, red doesn't hear blue. Blue doesn't hear red. And there's almost no connection between them. Uh, the important thought, though, is that there are shapes here and that there are shapes within the graph that we're going to go look for. We're going to look for hubs. Some people call them influencers. Actually, network theory offers us a slightly different concept of the influencer and suggests that hubs no doubt influential, have a cousin who is less visible, who is also influential, and that's the bridge. That's my bridge. Um, the bridge has only two points of contact, but boy, are they important. You can't get to wine country otherwise. Um, this is a picture of uh, Occupy Wall Street from last week. No. Um, th th this is Occupy Union Square from 99 years ago, literally, 1913. Uh, point to make here is that people come in clusters. They are not a monolith. They are not a uniform mass. They are not a regiment. They come in clumps. And that crowds continue to really matter. There's Mr. Obama with his crowd. Uh, crowds matter. Uh, certainly 2011 was the year of the crowd. But crowds, larger crowds, now form online than ever form in physical places. The cyber Tahrir is orders of magnitude larger than Tahrir itself. The challenge, as Mr. Obama is pointing out, and I think this was when he announced the federal program to support social media research. <laughs> no, it's a good idea, though. It really is. Uh, that is his tweet stream. That's the Obama tweet stream. But you know something? That's not a crowd, or at least the interface to it is not a crowd. This is what that crowd looks like. That's the network of the Obama tweet stream. And it reveals that there are people over here, they're called isolates, they're not connected to anybody. That means he's a brand, because brands are things that people who have not talked to another person about the topic know about. You know, you saw Toy Story, I saw Toy Story. What's the chance that we know each other? Zero. Uh, you tweeted UW Ethics, I tweeted UW Ethics. What's the chance that we know each other? Approach is one. I'll have a UW Ethics map in a second. So we have a tool, it's called Node Excel. It just makes this easy. It's, that's the point. It just makes it easy. You click a few buttons. How many lines of code will you have to master? Zero. That's the goal. So it allows you to start working in Excel with a bunch of dots and lines. And these dots and lines can tell stories. Here, for example, is a pair of contrasting maps, Tea Party versus Occupy. Occupy Wall Street, 15th November, Tea Party, 15th November. And the pattern tells us a great deal about the social structure of the people in that graph. Uh, for one thing, Tea Party is essentially a monolith. It is densely connected. And in fact, we find everywhere we look, if you look at any of these graphs, you see a really dense cluster of really tightly connected people. Who are those people? They are right-wing people. Le liberals uh, tolerate diversity. It's the problem. <laughs> yeah, we got to get rid of that. Uh, <laughs> So people within these networks have distinct patterns as well. And we look for these patterns because these patterns tell us who they are. We've been doing this a lot. We've been making lots of pictures. We are essentially trying to be news photographers for cyberspace crowds. And we think that those crowds really matter. Uh, not all of the data is from social media. This is the 2007 United States Senate voting records data. And this is which senators voted yay or nay in agreement with another senator on 370 bills. The data comes from Slate magazine. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, two clusters emerge, uh, East Coast and West Coast. All right, so that, that's right and left. Uh, there's a book, and the book will help you do things like this. This is the Scott and Walker graph made yesterday. And it allows us to highlight the kinds of people who occupy positions of strategic importance. Uh, it tells us which clusters exist and whether or not they have different opinions about the topic. Uh, we can look at, this is Scott and Walker without the follow graph, without the just following you. This is only the people who replied and mentioned to uh, one another. Uh, this is PolitiFact. Um, so if they're still in the room, we've mapped you. Uh, and PolitiFact shows the various clusters, the fact that some people are very opposed to PolitiFact. Those are the people who are disconnected from the PolitiFact graph. They don't actually reply, but they mention it and they don't like it. Um, here we can see one that I made last week. This is not an electoral issue, but this is still a, in many ways, a political and regulatory issue. This is pink slime. Everybody familiar with pink slime? The, uh, the term actually brought 
to the press in 2009 in, in the New York Times. Uh, it was mentioned by an industry, a beef industry person. He called it pink slime. It kind of stuck. Uh, but pink slime is that uh, finely textured beef product, uh, an Orwellian term if ever there was one, for offal and entrails washed with ammonia. Uh, but notice that this group and this group and over there, these are the apologists. These are the people who are defending the beef industry. These people and those people are against it. Uh, you'll see things where the word food revolution shows up, and of course that's the, uh, the hashtag used by the fellow Jamie Oliver who's made this his personal cause. So uh, there's also a website. You can go shopping for graphs. We uh, make it easy for you to publish your graph and your data there. The whole point of the system is to reduce this to three key, key clicks, three mouse downs. That's it. We don't want you to be a programmer, but we do want you to think link. So with that, I'll stop. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Mark. Ryan. Yeah. So um, I mean, I guess. Uh, you know, building off of that, you know, one of the things uh, that you know I really think is important to think about when you're thinking about social media and elections is just, uh, you know, basically taking people. You know, when we think about this in terms of votes and how do you actually translate, you know, activity on social networks into uh, actual votes um, and or volunteers. Um, one of the things that's that's sort of challenging, obviously, is just sort of you know. You're preaching to the choir. Somebody who's going to like your campaign um, on Facebook or follow you, um, chances are they're either you know looking for you know information, so they're a journalist or somebody who's a high information voter, um, or they're just a big supporter of you. So um, the challenge that I think we're facing is um, not facing, but campaigns in general face is uh, you know how do you take uh, you know those people um, in the same way that you know if that person walked into a field office in a campaign. You know, you give them uh, phone calls or a packet to go knock on doors. You know, how do you translate that action um, into an online realm? And you know, those networks um, that we were just talking about, uh, you know, I think offer an opportunity um, to, you know, bring that sort of offline engagement and mobilization um, into a digital realm. And I think, um, you know, social media tools in a way that has never been possible before. Uh, really offer that. Um, you know, I, I work in the digital department uh, on the Obama campaign. Uh, it's a department that didn't exist uh, on the campaign in 2008. Uh, and you know, not only do we exist now, we're a big part of the operation. And so uh, it, I think that really speaks to the ways in which campaign strategy and tactics and how you, know, you have to kind of meet people where they are um, has really uh, changed the political landscape. Um, you know, I was uh, a field organizer in 2008. I worked in a you know a campaign office um, doing just that. You know, getting people to make phone calls and knock on doors. I had a Twitter account. Uh, I didn't really use it, uh, but now we really uh, we want our organizers to have these tools and strategies as part of their you know part of their toolbox, right? So um, you collect that email from someone out in the field. Um, you know, when we do an, uh, a meeting down the road. Um, you know, we can now email you with that, and we're bringing more people into the into the fold as a result of these tools. And so, um, you know, being able to quickly and rapidly get out information about um, the events that are happening and, and the way that people also consume that information um, has really changed. And so, um, you know, we're always you know we've 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 done a you know a, a lot of work on. Um, you know, gathering that information, and taking a look at you know how how are people interacting with our pages? You know, how can we um, you know analyze you know what what types of content uh, is going to be um, the most successful? Um, and I think you know, obviously you know I, w I don't want to share too much of that, but like, <laughs> but uh, you know, Thomas I think is what's, taking notes. I think so what's, no. yeah, I think what's funny is that uh, you know people don't necessarily want the like long policy diatribes. Inevitably, the things that are um, you know, shared the most and engaged with the most are um, you know, sort of funny things or playful things, you know, Barack singing at the Apollo or a picture of Bo, the dog. Um, you know, uh, it, it's just a, a matter of course that, that people use these tools you know, as an entertainment platform as much as anything else. And so you know, the fact that you know, we, we kind of have to tailor our message and our streams to, to people who, you know, um, 
are not high information voters, but they're um, interested and engaged um, with campaign at sort of a, a surface level, and how do we sort of impact those people? And I think that's one of the things that, that we're really focusing on. All right, Thomas. Um, I actually agree with a lot of what um, Ryan's saying and Dia. <laughs> For about the only time yeah. between now and November 1. Right, right. <laughs> um, but the, the Obama campaign really was sort of pioneers in, in this space and really figuring out how um, to successfully tap into networks. And you've kind of seen a shift where at first, you know, they built my Barack Obama and then, you know, other campaigns thought, okay, well, we just need these massive networks. So between 2008 and then in the 2010 elections, there was this huge push for campaigns to try and inflate their Twitter accounts, even, even you know, as recently as 2011 with Newt Gingrich and his Twitter thing, as you were mentioning in some discussions we had. Um, and you'll, you saw that a lot, too, with um, other candidates um, across the country. They were more focused on how many Facebook fans or now likes that they had. And it was a popular item for journalists to cover. Um, but to people who actually work in this space, I think we've realized it's really just an arbitrary thing now because you can easily inflate it. Uh, Facebook's made their uh, advertising platform really simple, really affordable. Um, but at the end of the day, if those people aren't really doing much, it's sort of pointless, even if you have 100,000 likes. Um, so the thing that a lot of campaigns are working on now, um, a lot of the campaigns I work with, is how to get those people to tap into their networks on their own, um, which sort of plays into you know, what he was saying with kind of visualizing these networks. Um, so I think that's a trend you're going to start seeing a lot more of now is um, figuring out not, not only just in an activism level um, in terms of getting people to volunteer, but even fundraising uh, with a new platform called uh, Fundly that's out there now. It's getting people to tap into their networks, um, which, which is sort of kind of a, a unique territory in terms of the, the data side of things. Um, it really makes measurement uh, extremely important. And I know the Obama people measure everything. Um, a lot of campaigns on the right don't, but they're getting better at it. Um, I wouldn't say we're slow learners. We're just very, very calculated. Um, <laughs> but um, I, think, I think this is going to be really an interesting year, though, just to see. Um, I'm, I'm not sure you'll see a ton of new technologies, but you'll see a lot of adaptations of them that are actually um, improved on more on a data side. So it's stuff you guys might not even see on the surface, but you'll notice through different things, through retargeting or through just, um, just, just different techniques that um, they'll have a better idea of what you're doing, where you are, but maybe focus more on getting you to invite your people into the network as opposed to just trying to get all your information because most campaigns have all of your information anyway. Um, so it's, it's going to be an interesting time to see, especially I know the Obama people aren't even done rolling out all the stuff that they'll have coming out. Um, the Romney people, it's the same thing. So the presidential election is going to be extremely interesting, but even more so on a local level, just watching a lot of the, the Senate primary, seeing what the candidates come out with. Um, kind of an interesting time, and, and uh, I, I wish journalists would cover it more, um, but it, it's one of those things, what, what to cover and how to cover it, but I guess that's one of the things we'll have to figure out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick that up, the, the what to cover and how to cover it, and, and I don't know, Mark, if you can oh, yeah, throw can back up there the polarization graphic. So, um, you know, when I talk with reporters and, and with students as well, in a time of such intense polarization, what you know, where do journalists fit? How do you cover that? Is there, you know, you, you, you I think you use the cliches, we're preaching to the choir. Um, how do journalists get your choir to listen? Because they're not preaching what you preach. <laughs> you know, if, the, if they're trying to be in that middle, if they're trying to represent all citizens, not just citizens on one side, what's the future? And how might they use these tools to, to move people away from just receiving a, a, a message with which they already agree? I guess I open that, that up to all of you. Yeah, I mean, I think the question there, I think, to just dig into it is like, you know, how do you quantify, you know, the debate, right? So, <laughs> like this. You can, you, <laughs> well, right. Like, so you can say like the. So that's but Obamacare. The, sure. Well, there's a there's a difference between volume of communication and actual like what's the thing. So, do, do, I think the question is, do um, the people who are most vociferous or just loud on an issue, um, does that really represent the, the majority or sort of an electorally significant um, sector of the population? And you know, I, I don't think that that's always the case. Um, and I think one of the things that's challenging, I think, for covering, uh, journalists covering this is, you know, how do you, how do you discern whether somebody, if, just because they're influential doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that's going to affect how the election, the outcomes of the election. So. Um, 
that's not an answer. It's more of a question, but I think it's uh, you know uh, an interesting um, thing where like you know we have very influential people um, on these social media tools with lots of followers. Um, you know they're gonna be able to have a louder microphone, but does that actually change minds? And that's sort of how do you measure the effectiveness of these tools? So Mark, what do you think about that kind of measurement? I mean, how do you measure? You know, if you're uh, if you're Mark Pitch over here from the State Journal and you're looking at um, covering the gubernatorial prime Democratic gubernatorial recall primary, um, and you see Barrett Falk <laughs> really separated, how does what, what does he do in the middle there? How how does he draw people from those two camps? Right. Um, so I'll first agree that influence is a term that has been widely used in this field and that the, the search for the influential is the main goal. And the problem I have as a sociologist, I have to say, uh, there's more than one kind of influence and that there is no um, clear distinction in our notion of influencer. And so I'm going to offer you a, an alternative term to uh, think of what, what is this goodness that we're looking for, and that is strategic location. And so here you see that some people are over here, they're isolates, they're in this lower right-hand corner, they connect to no one, but they said the word Obamacare. Are they influential? Well, if you're looking for new voters, those people are the most important people in the room. But wait, what about these people? Uh, so the, the size of the square that you'll see here is equal to the number of followers they've got. But some people have huge follower count and have no strategic location quality within this graph. So talking about Obamacare, these people have big follower counts, but they're not at the center of this conversation. And that's a distinction that network theory can reveal. I call these people with lots of followers who come into a discussion space visiting dignitaries. But they're not, you know, if, if Oprah says the word Obamacare, that's great, and that's a lot of visibility, and I would say Oprah counts as a Jupiter-class object in the Twitter sphere. <laughs> um, not, I'm not talking about weight, I'm just talking about importance. <laughs> I'm saying that uh, she doesn't have the level of influence that I, as a sociologist, would acc uh, accrue to some smaller person who is at the center of, and importantly, not just at the center, but at the bridge point. And so hubs are easy to think of as influencers. They are well connected. But bridges are hard to think of as influencers. They often have very few connections, but they're the only bridge, let's say, to another language community or another professional community. And these bridge people, we have a word for measuring their quality. We call it betweenness centrality. Why don't we go back to calling them the bridges? Uh, so w the bridge people often are very hard to see. They don't have high follower accounts, but they are the only path between San Francisco and Marin. And so those are concepts of influence that I think that network science offers. And it's true that just getting more followers means nothing, means absolutely nothing. If anything, I, I often will reject people who have followed me who I think really are not here for my brand. You, you don't want sociology. You come to the wrong place. And I will block you. I don't want an audience that doesn't actually want what I have to offer. And so volume doesn't count. It's quality, it's strategic location that counts. And so how do you do that? You, you have to map. You have to map. And then you'll often find that there is going to be a, you know, a, a for and against it group. I, I, another one that I could bring up that's a little bit more clear is the Keystone XL group. And what do you know? There's a small cluster of people who are really positive about this. And all of their accounts have names like TransCanada <laughs> and Energon. What do you know? <laughs> They're pro Keystone XL. But you don't really know that when you read the tweet stream. You don't get that sense of, look, this is a group of people who, and I know, are increasingly densely connected to themselves and less and less densely connected across to the rest of the electorate. So I think influence has a lot to do with strategic location and less to do with just raw follower count. So another question. <laughs> um, I think, Thomas, you mentioned. from the floor. Oh, yeah. Couple. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, let me see if I can find one that's So again, let me clearer. just repeat the question for those people out in the, in the world who want to hear it. Ellen asked, um, where on this do we find a bridge or how can you identify that person or those people? Right. Uh, there are, and maybe I'll, I'll bring up a different image to illustrate this. Um, 
So here, this person in the Tea Party graph, I'm sorry, this is the Occupy graph, uh, this person connects to this other cluster. So they're a bridge. Uh, these are otherwise separate clusters, this one, this one. And what we, what we find is that there are these people who will span the clusters. They actually connect across the boundaries, whereas most people are local people. They connect to a hub, and they never connect outside of their cluster to another hub. And so bridges are these people who have that connective capacity. It, it's also worth noting that you don't have to look at the picture to see if you could see them. The picture is important. It gives you kind of an intuition and an overview. Uh, but all of this is data. And so in an Excel spreadsheet, we sort by betweenness, and they come to the top. So, so you would imagine that our friends who don't want to tell us their secrets here today <laughs> are looking at these bridge people and trying to reach them? I think they don't know to look for bridge people yet. Pardon me? I, I believe that they do not yet know about between the centrality and are not yet aware of the strategic importance of bridges. Well, I would say, and it's not a secret, I mean, we do uh, grassroots organizing. Um, and really what this is, is connecting um, the campaign to a local place. Um, and that this is the offline uh, or online you know, uh, you know, uh, reflection of that. Um, so in our neighborhoods uh, that we're organizing in, um, we have somebody who's, you know, whose role it is to cover um, and exist in this place. And I think that's the way that our campaign, at least, is you know, connecting um, you know, the sort of big presidential race campaign to local networks and getting into those things. And you know, the, the relationships that you build in the real world um, can you know, be translated there. And you know, you know, we empower them to be those messengers for those. And, and in terms of the, the influencers, I think the only significance they really have on the campaigns I've worked with and working for now is for the press team, just in terms of disseminating um, press releases. And it's usually, you usually email those influencers to see if they can post something on Twitter, which is always kind of interesting to me. But in terms of um, you know, some of these, um, these outliers or the, even, even the ones that don't necessarily connect to these clusters, that's, those are the people that the on-the-ground staff are now paying attention to, the field staff in their areas. It's really, especially on Twitter, for example, it's easy to search by a, a geographic area. It's not perfect, but you can do it. Um, and that's what a lot of field, field uh, reps are paying attention to in specific geographic areas, whether it be county or region. And those are the people that they'll answer the questions for. It may not be the main campaign account that's paying attention to it, but there's usually somebody paying attention to everything that's going on in their area. Did you have a follow-up to that, Mark? Oh. Uh, I, well, I, I'll just note that in these two images, the, the takeaway for me is that uh, over in Tea Party, there are relatively few isolates. Few people talk about Tea Party who are not already friends, followers, or connected to other Tea Party people. Occupy has, at least uh, this was in November, and things have changed, and it may change again, but uh, Occupy is a brand. This was a community. And, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, unless you're trying to elect somebody, uh, but you know, communities are in groups. And they don't have a lot of visibility outside of their community. And so, for example, who will ever say the hashtag UW ethics who was not in this room or knows somebody in this room? You know, it starts to approach zero. Very few. Whereas these topics are things that should be in the public consciousness that lots of people can talk about. And what I see here is that Tea Party has essentially consumed all the oxygen in its space and has attached itself to all the people who are Tea Party, you know, there's a kind of angiogenesis kind of thing. They're reaching out to all the sources of energy they can, and they've done it. And it's over because the number of isolates is not increasing. And so these are the kinds of insights I think that can illustrate some changes. Now, lots of caveats here. This is Twitter. It's only Twitter. This is not reaching into the minds of 220 million adult Americans and finding out what they really think and how they connect. This is people who tweet about political topics in Twitter. And we know that that requires a lot of bracketing to say, well, is this representative? I, I, I don't even attempt to make the claim to representative uh, quality of the data. My goal is to study social media. That's, that I it is representative of people who talked about these topics in social media. By way of background, what do we know about that percentage of, of American adults who are on Twitter? What was the percentage? 13. 13. Well, 13. Yeah. What, what do we know about that percentage? Are they 
you know, more educated? Are they richer? Are they younger? Are they more male? What, what, There's a lot of demographic discussion. I mean, I, the one thing I will say is you, you should be issued a very large grain of salt whenever <laughs> anybody gives you a user count number. Uh, so for example, there's a very good chance that 90% of these numbers are people who logged in once and never will log in again. So we should, I, I like to just simply whack every number down by an order of magnitude to get a, a, a little bit of a sanity check on it. Yeah, Pew's data actually does a pretty decent job of, of doing those counts by, mm -hmm. by frequency of, of, of activity. So I think there, there are some more reliable numbers out there than others. But I want to come back to a point that you made, Thomas, for journalists about um, you know, covering these false or inflated, I mean, I suppose inflated would be the, the generous word, lying would, be, <laughs> would maybe be the right word, but these numbers of followers and the numbers of likes, and you said that's really not where the, the story is, because we, we, it, they're not accurate, they may have been purchased. Give me some other stories that should be followed. If, I, you know, if I'm a political reporter and I'm, I'm covering the Wisconsin recall or I'm covering the, um, the, the let's all replace Herb Cole race, what are some of the stories I should be doing? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to kind of ask a geek what a, what a journalist should be writing about for the masses. But um, I think, you know, um, a, a lot of it is maybe not even in terms of writing, you know, just simple things like these graphs are making them interactive and just kind of laying it out for people and explaining what's there and then letting them explore um, from there, I think, would just really help people kind of understand what's really happening. Um, the same way, you know, a lot of newspapers are doing with um, campaign contributions. They're not focusing as much on putting names in there, but they're giving you these searchable databases and these different tools you can use to visualize. Um, so I think maybe just providing the visualizations, and maybe just jump-starting them to kind of give them an idea of different things that can be seen from that, whether it be engagement um, or things like that. And the great thing about those is it's basically just a, a tool that updates itself, so you can just keep coming back to it or you know, pointing out new things as they come about. Um, but that, that is a challenge with online stuff, is you know, usually the stuff that gets covered is when a when a campaign staffer posts something that they didn't mean to post um, and they catch it before it was deleted, they get that, that golden screenshot, um, which just, so I'm always afraid of that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's the stuff of numbers. But, but um, it, it, it is, I think it is a challenge. And I, I guess you know, maybe you have some ideas, too. I'm, I'm not a journalist, so. Um. No, uh, yeah, so I mean, I think. Uh, there, there is a def, definitely a challenge. I think uh, you know one one of the things you could also look at is just sort of the the breadth of um, engagement, um, right? So um, you know you can have this one campaign account uh, or set uh, a social networks, but then also um, you know we're also reaching out in in different and new ways as a, as a campaign. You know we're on Google Plus and Instagram and Pinterest and all these sort of new places where you know the normal networks haven't really had a chance to sort of solidify yet um, and I think um, yeah you're gonna get these people who are just sort of high information high social network users but then also um, you know especially for Pinterest is a great example of a place that we just launched um, a couple weeks ago and it's just you know it's kind of the Wild West in a lot of ways we're just doing this for the first time and figuring out um, you know how, how to communicate with these different networks, but uh, you know, I, I, I think that there are going to be some people who are gravitating to these networks who um, are outside of that. They're the bridges that, that we're talking about. Um, and you know, if you can put a campaign's message next to other interests in a way that Facebook does, you know, yeah, your campaign is competing against not just other the other campaign or other you know other news but also like pictures of cats right it, or you know what you know wedding dresses or whatever else is on uh, that thing or you know things that are happening in people's <laughs> lives um, so the the degree of authenticity that a campaign has to have in a, a you know building a relationship with with um, voters is is even more important Mark, I'd like to ask you uh, maybe a little bit of a technical question but is it going to be possible or is it possible to bring a geographic dimension to your graphs. I'm interested in the global uh, trends in democracy and social media. So for example, if I wanted to better understand uh, traffic in social media, especially say in Twitter from Iran, and how much was diaspora versus inside, um, could you just give us a sense of whether you can put this stuff on a real map? Yeah, yeah. Um, roughly 5% of 
tweets contain a lot long. So that means that you tweeted from your phone, it had GPS, you said yes to the can Twitter know your location, and it actually put your lat long on there. And so I have you know, a billion tweets or so in my data set, and roughly 50 million of them have lat longs. Um, they are remarkably accurate. So, well, put it this way, they're remarkably precise. The accuracy is actually hard to determine, but they give you a latitude and a longitude that actually points directly at a room in a house. Or more to the point, when I've done it and looked at me, I could tell the difference between tweeting from my living room and tweeting from my bedroom. Okay? So yes, remarkable <laughs> precision. Accuracy is hard to determine uh, because you don't really know that the person was there. But yeah, it is relatively trivial to take this data and pump it into Google Maps, Google Earth, Bing Maps, any of OpenStreetMaps. Um, and it's a very active area of cyber geography. I think about the work of, for example, Mark Graham at the Oxford Internet Institute, who looks at who edits the various language Wikipedias from which countries. And it turns out that there are more edits to the English language Wikipedia from Hong Kong than all of Africa says something about the differential rates of accessibility, uh, affluence, network connection. So uh, short answer, yes, uh, if you're willing to accept a 5% sample where you know, most tweets do not have a lat long, um, and the kinds of people who put lat longs on their tweets are the people with smartphones. So you're skewing your sample again and again. Uh, but I'll also point you to the work of Morningside Analytics a uh, group in New York City up in Morningside Heights. Uh, and they recently, re, uh, well, in 2008, they produced a report with the Berkman Center uh, studying the Persian blogosphere. They have just released another Berkman study uh, studying the Russian blogosphere. And the work of John Kelly does a, a great deal to illuminate the ways these national blogospheres break out into sub-areas. And I, I think John has one of the, the greatest observations that uh, when political people talk about politics, this is not news. But when people who would rather be talking about football talk about politics, that is news. Uh, and he is able to show that prior to the aborted Green Revolution in uh, Iran, that there was this growing amount of political chatter in what were otherwise dev discussions devoted to poetry, um, which fills the role of rock and roll in Iran, apparently. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, it, there is a lot of geographic cyberspace uh, research, and it is possible. The, the finding was that very little of the, the tweeting came out of Iran, that it was mostly diaspora and, uh, Iranians. So watch me be a bridger here, because I'm going to pick back <laughs> up on something. Um, Thomas was talking about data, the power of data in election 2012, and how important it's going to be in journalism. I think that's undeniable. Um, watching the money flow, for those of you who chose to be here instead of the leader session, it's, it's, it's absolutely critical. But it is the Wild West. Um, so see, I bridged from you to you, and now watch me go over to Mark. Mark, from a sociologist's perspective, what are some of the ethical considerations we have to look at in presenting data? So for instance, it seems to me there's a fundamental difference between um, mapping a vote count um, in Wisconsin as solid blue versus solid red by county, as a lot of um, organizations did with our recent um, state Supreme Court justice um, election. You might have heard a thing or two about that. <laughs> Just a little small issue. Um, that versus a heat map, which will show some parts of the state seriously red, seriously blue, but many squarely in purple. Mm -hmm. So if, if everybody's going out and talking to programmers, deciding how they're going to um, bring d incorporate data into their journalism, what are the ethical dimensions of that? What should they be thinking about? Not all data should be used. Some data should not even be collected. Um, and data that exists that could be useful for you, you might want to refrain from using, especially when what could possibly uh, pass as informed consent is questionable. And so most of us do not fully comprehend just how much we are revealing. Most of us just don't get it. But as you said, we don't really need you to tell us your phone number. We know your phone number. We also know the name of your dog. We also know your favorite television program. We know the music you like. We, you are an open book. Now, you know, if you've clicked, 
if you've dialed, and, and it doesn't even have to be the web. I mean, it's worth noting that most of your cable systems are now digital cable systems. And if you watch TV, they record every time you change the channel. And they can, t they can tell who is sitting on the couch based on which channels, how fast you go through them, and where do you dwell. So it doesn't really matter that you're not an internet user. You may have one of those old clunky phones. It doesn't really matter. We're watching you anyway. So what are the limits of this? Uh, you know, journalists no doubt have codes of ethics. Sociologists do. And it largely is based on informed consent. And so I'll note that all of these maps uh, are generated out of public data. But there are ways of getting less than public data. And they're not necessarily ethical. And so given how much information there is out there, I would say that you should really look at data provenance and say, how did we get this data? Where did it come from? And who gave it up? And under what circumstances? Because most of us give up tons of data, and we don't even realize it. And we have not in the slightest made an informed consent. How much do your campaigns, how much do your clients, your campaign, your clients, think about the ethics, you know, questions of privacy? I'll, I, I will have to say Mark blew my mind with the whole um, lat long for me tweeting from my bedroom. That's not good. <laughs> that was disturbing. <laughs> and I'm pretty careful about my privacy. Very but how, mu how much, how active a conversation <laughs> is that? Or is it, we have an election to win? It's, good. well, yeah, no, I mean, we, we, we talk a lot about, you know, uh, being authentic with people and you know making developing a relationship with the voters and that's really thrown out the window um, you know when people feel like what you're doing is just sort of data mining um, you know what our campaign has really tried to do I think and I think past campaigns have tried but haven't had the manpower uh, is just sort of treating um, the individual voter as an as an individual and not part of a you know geographic or voting block um, and so, so taking some of these data applications and delivering something uh, that is meaningful to voters. So you know, we know that um, you know you clicked on um, a link to you know f you know from a, a source of from on Facebook of a picture uh, or something like that, um, and maybe you're interested in something that was contained in that picture. And so what we're going to do is you know turn around and you know deliver you more information about. Uh, you know about those issues and topics that you've sort of opted into not verbally but by your actions and so I don't view that as unethical I view that as um, you know tailoring a message to be the most relevant to your constituencies as possible um, and I think that treating voters as people and not groups uh, I think in the end is more ethical than and more authentic yeah I would agree off of that um, I'd come piggyback off of that um, you know the same holds to a lot of the campaigns I work with with email um, if they're more if uh, constituents or uh, volunteers whatever are more inclined to open certain types of email then we know in our database is to only send them those emails so it actually you know the more data we have the the more enjoyable we make what usually is a stressful campaign time um, and we, not so much with maybe direct mail but um, your mailboxes will still be flooded I don't do much with that luckily though <laughs> um, but but I say the the one place I think where people really get concerned is in in the online advertising space, especially when you get into um, retargeting, where you're basically putting cookies on their computers. Um, none of that information is actually personally identifiable, in theory. Um, but um, they Mark, Mark just had a head shake. I think he wants to take up yeah. that theory. But you go ahead. Yeah, and Leaf will do it for a dime a name. Right, <laughs> and it is identifiable. Right, right. But um, in th right, exactly. Um, but from, from what most campaigns are using, they, they're just using Google's remarketing program, as they call it, which most campaigns will never do that. But people do get concerned, and they do think that campaigns that are following them all over the internet and tracking all of their viewing habits, which is kind of what Quantcast does um, with, with some of their tags. Um, but for the most part, it's just kind of reassuring them or having good policies on your website. If you're, running, if you're running any advertising program like that, it should be included in a privacy policy on a website, or you should have your own. Uh, cookie policy, and if the campaigns don't, that should be on them, um, and they should be challenged on why they don't have that, um, and if they actually plan on having that, because it's usually a requirement too. So, 
So that's a story right there, actually. That's right. a, a very interesting story to be covered. I had, um, you know, given my involvement in ethics, I had a very frustrated um, Wisconsin. I'm loath to bring up the recall petition signing thing again because, boy, did that set people on fire. But I had someone contact me who had signed, a citizen who had signed the recall petition and was enraged that um, she was now receiving um, campaign literature from, um, from a number of different Democrats saying, they took my name off that, my, my name and address and email address off of that um, recall petition, and now they're targeting me. And isn't that unethical? Is it? Uh, well, I mean, it, you know, people, I think it gets to what he was saying is that people put, put out things in the world that they don't necessarily realize is, is public. I mean, your voter registration form and the information on that is public file and uh, campaigns uh, ever since databases have been built, uh, you know, you could always walk into um, the city clerk's office and have them print off, you know, for the printing fee, the, the list of registered voters on the rolls and call them up. Um, so that's not anything new, it's just the technology has made it much more efficient um, and, you know, using some of the other data sources, it just made it more efficient to, to contact <coughs> people. And so, I mean, I, I can't speak to, to the other campaigns contacting her, but I mean, it, I think it speaks to the level in which people um, put information out there that they don't necessarily realize they're putting out there. And it's, it's like a camping finance report. It's illegal to actually download those to contact people or solicit. You can tell most campaigns probably do it, especially if you make that one contribution to the other side and all of a sudden you're now on every list. But So Mark, go ahead and get your point, but where did, when did uh, well, we'll well, just I, have you. Wh whether it's ethical, it's certainly something that voters dislike. Uh, that was my strong sense from this lovely lady. <laughs> I, I think it cost a certain someone a vote, but. <laughs> so the question there? That was kind of my point. I mean, I, I mean we're being inundated with television commercials uh, here on the radio. Of course, I'm not a political advertising newspaper. He works for the newspaper, which is not the unfortunate. Um, but isn't there a danger? I mean, how, how careful do campaigns have to be about inundating uh, the electorate? So the question is just to repeat for those who are watching on video. The question was, how scared um, do campaigns have to be? How careful? I don't believe you used the word scared. How careful do they have to be um, with inundating people with these kinds of messages? Uh, I, I, go ahead. I would say I would say very careful, especially when you mention Facebook, Twitter, or email. It's very very easy on Facebook. Just you don't want to see updates from this person anymore, which basically makes them entirely inaccessible to the campaign because they're not going to see your updates unless they actually go to your page. Twitter, they can easily hide you from their feed depending on what programs they're using. And email, it's very easy to just mark them as spam or create a filter you know, that'll go to some folder where you might read it if you feel like reading political stuff, but usually you never do. Um, so it's something that I think campaigns have to be really aware of, and we can all name tons of campaigns that have really just ruined, ruined their online um, presence just by overdoing it or just not really focusing on a message as opposed to, all right, let's just get a bunch of likes, or let's just do this. And it just people just drown, that, they drown out on that. Yeah, I think the, the key here is, is the difference between strategy and tactic. Um, you know, a, a tactic of, you know, I think some people in politics have the, the thing, we'll, we'll just email this out, we'll blast it out, uh, and that'll be how we build for whatever event or thing that they're trying to accomplish. Um, but, you know, if, if you know, 25 people show up and you get 50 unsubscribes from that email because it was not relevant to them, it was far from them, it wasn't something that they're interested in. Um, I would argue that that's actually a net loss because as you say, you know, those, you know, you might have gotten some people out uh, or have take, you got some people to take action that you wanted them to, but at the same time, you've now lost, you know, 50 people that you can go back to over and over again if you hadn't bugged them with that. So. I definitely think that you know uh, there's a cost associated and a value associated with all the information and opt-ins that you have, and when you lose those, that's that's a real tangible loss to your campaign. I I think you could also argue that it's a tangible loss in journalism when news organizations see um, let's get on Twitter, let's be on Facebook as a strategy. When it's not, it's a tactic that you right. that you need to use in service of a larger strategy. In most cases, that strategy being engagement. Um, and so if it's all about let's get on Twitter and not about why are we getting on Twitter and in service of what are we getting on Twitter, I think that's a, that's a big mistake a lot of news organizations can make. Maybe follow up to that question. Mm -hmm. um, so then how often then do you advise 
your candidates that they should do an actual personal tweet first. So how often do you advise candidates to do a candidate oh. tweet? And, and, and I would, I'm going to piggyback onto that. And do you um, suggest that they self-identify, that they put you know, a little uh, TB if they're Tom Baird? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, would say, I would say most candidates probably don't actually actively manage their Twitter accounts, even if it's perceived that they do. And I, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Because you'll, you'll catch it eventually, especially if you ever actually talk to a candidate. It's very different than from how it's posted on the internet. Um, I've, I've always told clients that you don't need to be the ones posting stuff on Twitter. I don't think people really care if it's you posting it. Um, I've never really understood the um, trying to disguise a tweet to make it look like it's coming from the candidate. Um, and if you are going to do that, then you know, in those situations, you know, use, I, mean, I guess you could identify it, but I, I don't even see a need. Some t if, the, if the candidate is actually not going to be doing it himself or herself, then you, there's really probably not even a need unless it's a quote that you're just going to pull or something, which... And so the journalistic matter. ethics of that would be not quoting tweets as if you're quoting a candidate, because you can be fairly certain that that's not the candidate. So it's so the same reason that we wouldn't quote directly from a press release. You know, Tom Barrington write that press release that, you know, he, there are quote marks around what he is alleged to have said, but the likelihood that he said it that way is very, very small. Yeah, well, I certainly don't uh, advise the president on his tweeting, but uh, <laughs> we, I, our campaign, all of our uh, principal accounts uh, have in the profile, you know, tweets from um, the president or Joe Biden or Michelle Obama as uh, their initials, um, and so that is actually the way that we distinguish it. Um, you know, I think uh, I think journalists or, or uh, sorry, elected officials. Uh, you know, do that at their own peril. I think that it, there's a, a, a cost associated with it. So Chuck Grassley the other day caused the big dust up, and I think you know he is definitely tweeting, and uh, you know everyone kind of knows that he is actually tweeting it. And you know I think um, you know for whatever it's worth, you know he um, you know has developed that like following uh, on his Twitter account based on the knowledge of that on the authenticity. So um, you know people are paying attention to uh, what he's saying. Um, you know, there's a couple other senators, uh, Claire McCaskill is another one who mm -hmm. I think um, really takes a lot of ownership over their thing. So they uh, view it as a, a platform to go directly to the people, which they really value, but at the same time, you know, there's some perils associated with that as well. Well, I think Scott Walker is an example of someone who I, I would venture, if not 100%, close to 100% of um, tweets coming out of his governor's account have been by him. Yep. It's, it's cost him at times. Yeah, but I think from the eth ethical perspective, you, uh, a campaign should absolutely sort of divulge whether or not they are. And if, if you're going to have a staffer sort of pretend to be that person, you're asking for a little bit of trouble. So I think people uh, sort of assume if it's a ca big campaign that the, a person's not you know, tweeting out a candidate, isn't tweeting out uh, you know, links and stuff like that. They're out campaigning or if they have a, they're elected. You know, they have a job to do, so uh, I don't think it's necessary. So, is there another question? I do have one wrap-up question. Have I missed anybody? I just want to make sure. Okay, so Mark, my my last one is to you. What um, what does research, if you know, tell us about how people see their own social media space versus other media spaces? So, might they view? Facebook as a more personal medium um, than ABC, ABC World News Tonight. So if they see a broadcast political ad on ABC, that is something that they're used to. But if it comes at them on Facebook and it's something with which they disagree, is that a different space to people? It's not a mass medium in, in a lot of oh, minds. Yeah. What, what, what do we know about that? Uh, <coughs> that people often have relatively politically diverse extended social networks and that they don't like to hear from them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I have stopped following lots of people who push content that I deeply find offensive and I don't want to hear it. Um, I also know that there are people who are in my ideological lane who are out ahead of me and they push a lot of content at me too and you know i end up looking like you know some kind of uh conservative by comparison to my my stream they're telling me that you know i don't know uh, there are more left-wing positions than even i will take and i i think what happens in facebook is that you don't want to really hear that much about the people that you know a little bit who have very very different opinions from you 
um, you find them jarring. Most people find really strongly, you know, the, the other ideological side has views that are deeply offensive to the other side. And I don't think that Facebook is a wonderful place to suddenly go and engage those ideas. And it does give you all the affordances to not. And in that second wave of Facebook, when the early adopters finished, and then everybody's mother and cousin caught on, uh, that's when a lot of people found themselves blocked or didn't know that they were blocked. But you know, I, I have relatives who I deeply disagree with, and I choose not to hear from them. So yeah, it, it, it's a place for me that is about m curating my worldview. And I don't want to hear your worldview that much, really. I mean, none of us do. I mean, I don't want to be told that I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kathy. Actually, as a journalist, I do want to hear them. I have a Facebook account. I rarely put anything on there, but I go on almost every day. And I have an incredibly diverse family hmm. of opinion, opinionated people. Hmm. Those who know me would be surprised by that. Hmm. And um, I don't respond. And sometimes it's really hard not to respond because I don't want to be out there with any opinion. But I enjoy hearing from them, especially those who live in Wisconsin, when I'm responsible for knowing what's going on around here. Sometimes living in Madison, that's not giving me a good look at what's going on around Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So it can it can be a space depending on how you how you view your linkages to others. It can be a, a, a space to spontaneously burst your your yeah. bubble. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, but that, but you, I'll say that that's a professional use of the service yes. and one that isn't typical of the average user. Right. Right. But, but 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 one that is valuable for you as an ethical journalist. I, I would say in closing, as Wendy is ready to, to like take the take the hook and get me off the stage. I would say in closing that you know we ended that uh, or we were near the end of that last session with discussions about you know is it ethical or unethical for a journalist to sign a recall petition. And I would say in, in uh, that that is one small question compared to the amount of content that is available in your own social media streams. One of the biggest ethical struggles today is how much do you have to surrender your personal life in this discoverable online space to maintain integrity as a journalist. And just to, uh, by way of background, I looked at some of the people who were coming today who are working as journalists. and found a number of things pretty easily online that I think people um, thought would be private and aren't. And so you have to be constantly aware of what is shareable, what is visible, what's public. So thank you so much to all of the panelists. I really thank appreciate you. it. Glad you two didn't come to fisticuffs. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no. Very affable, guys. There's hope. There's hope for an unpolarized society.